Hello, I'm Thomas Hare, the Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct-to-consumer marketing world. I'm speaking, to you for the, I'm speaking to you today from Newburyport, Massachusetts, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the latest live webinar event in our summer seminar series. Today's webinar, Brand versus Direct Response, Ending the War Between Branding and Direct Response, features marketing leader, keynoter, and author, Tim Ash. Tim is an acknowledged authority in ev on evolutionary psychology and digital marketing. He's a sought after international keynote speaker and the best selling author of the recently published Unleash Your Primal Brain, as well as Landing Page Optimization. Ash has been mentioned by Forbes as a top 10 online marketing expert and by Entrepreneur Magazine as an online marketing influencer to watch. For 19 years, he was co founder and CEO of Site Tuners, a digital optimization agency. He helped create more than $1.2 billion in value for companies like Google, Expedia, eHarmony, Facebook, American Express, Canon, Nestle, Symantec, Intuit, Humana, Siemens, and Cisco. We'll be welcoming Tim momentarily, but before we get started, a couple of pieces of housekeeping. In your control panel, you'll see a tab entitled Handouts. In that Handouts tab, you'll find three PDFs, including a copy of Tim's presentation from today, a chapter from his new book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, and a PDMI membership brochure. So feel free to download those at any time during this process and uh, take a look at them following the event. In addition, you'll see a questions tab. Uh, that's where you're able to send in your questions for Tim. We'll be having a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation, but please send in your questions whenever they strike. We'll be collecting those questions uh, during the presentation and we'll then uh, share them with Tim and address them in the closing minutes of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to you, Tim. Thanks for joining us. Take it away. Ah, my pleasure, Thomas. Great to be here. Let's get rolling right away. I want to talk today about something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is ending the bloodshed. Unfortunately, right now we have a war going on. Um, we're talking here about performance-driven marketing. So we're on the direct response side of things, I guess you could say, as opposed to the branding side. So what I'm gonna do in this, this presentation today is introduce the two combatants, uh, and then I'm gonna talk about understanding what branding really is and how to do it better. And after that, I'll talk about how to bring both sides together so that they're working in unison and describe a way forward that's not adversarial. So we're gonna jump right in and the first thing I wanna do is talk about the direct response view of the branding people. This will probably be near and dear to your heart. First thing we think about branding is that branding people are restrictive. They're always shutting down our ideas for some kind of technicalities. We once did a landing page test on the homepage of Texas Instruments. In order to be able to do that, they gave us a 170 page brand brief that laid out the fonts that we could use in the submenus. I'm not kidding you. So that is some idea of what branding people think their job is. Here's our brand guidelines. You have to stick to this. Our job is done. Congratulations. No, that's not branding. Another thing you often see on the brand side is what I call madman arrogance. Um, everyone's got an opinion. An opinion is like a butthole, everybody's got one. Unfortunately, branding people think that their opinions matter more than other people's. They're amazing with these kind of unsubstantiated opinions. It's like, well, I don't think that this blah, 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 you fill in the blank, but just declaring that I don't think it's so seems to be enough because of course they're the masters of the universe. And finally, they're controlling. Uh, they're often, very, very focused on you know, the mechanics of the campaigns, of having the right sign-offs, having the right technical compliance issues. I'm not saying this isn't necessary. If you're in a highly regulated industry, in a way it's kind of inevitable if you sell insurance or if you're working on healthcare or something like that, there should be privacy considerations and uh, consumer fraud protection and things like that. I think that makes for a better society. But when it goes overboard and the lawyers are really the ones in charge of your brand, that becomes a problem. So the other thing is branding is kind of hard to describe in the sense of uh, what's the point of it? 
what does branding actually do? Uh, John Wanamaker, the famous uh, retail pioneer said this, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. And that still remains true even with digital marketing today. Because advertising is considered part of branding. It's not under the direct response umbrella. Another knock that I often hear against the branding folks is that they're visually obsessed. So they'd rather look good than have a clarity or good functionality behind what they're doing. It's got to look just right. And another characteristic you'll often see, especially if big dollars are involved, is that branding people often recycle media. Have you ever had a situation where you've done a print campaign or a photo shoot or a catalog or something, and then they say, well, just reuse that for the website. Perfect. Because one medium is just as good as another. So a 30-minute infomercial is just like a giant billboard by the side of the freeway, isn't it? And that's very similar do a podcast audio um, ad that lasts 10 seconds. Well, no, all of those are different. Yet branding insists on taking your at least high cost, if not high value assets and reusing them all over the place across all channels. Now, the favorite phrase of branding people is this. That's off brand. Yes, that's off brand. I'm sure you've heard that before, and unfortunately, it's a conversation stopper. There's nowhere to go after that. It's just been declared off-brand, and your ideas are no longer workable. So when we look at this, the typical end result that you see from branding campaigns looks a little something like this, and this is a real example of a website for a well-known brand, the Armani Exchange. Ta-da! Now, let me ask you a quick question. What is the purpose of this website? I'm gonna give you a clue. They actually sell stuff online. This is their e-commerce site. And yet what it has is a black and white photo front and center and then giant headshots or partial headshots of uh, guys that clearly need a shave. Um, and this is their e-commerce site. This is supposed to sell stuff. Unfortunately, it doesn't. So the standards for judging the effectiveness of a brand is, oh, it doesn't work so well, but damn, it looks great. That's apparently how you win all kinds of advertising and branding awards. So I've painted a pretty negative picture of branding, and and I don't know if we can do polls, um, but you know, just it just in the Q and A, if you just say, do you recognize the branding people in this? Scale of one to ten, how well did I nail them? Ten meaning dead on, zero means you're off base, Tim. So just pop those uh, those questions in there, or I mean, it's answers in the question pane, please. So we've talked about what branding looks like to us, the direct response people. And like I said, it's not a very flattering picture, but let's take a look at it from their perspective. What do they think of performance marketing? What do they think of direct response? What do they think of all of those measurable ROI-driven campaigns that we're all so proud of? Yeah, the first knock is appropriate for sure. That direct response marketers are ignorant of the big picture. We're happy with tactical fiddling. Hey, what's the ROI on this keyword? You know, or return on ad spend of this keyword? Uh, can we tweak the copy in this ad? Um, should we animate that banner? I mean, these are tactical fiddling without seeing the big picture or what's going on in the larger context of the brand. The other thing is that uh, we'll pretty much try everything. I don't know if any of you have actually watched TV uh, in the past, but there was the sham wow commercial. Hey, it's this chamois cloth that cleans and buffs everything. And we even had apparently a Muppet as part of that infomercial. So, but to the branding folks, we're unprofessional. We're clowns that are willing to do anything and to, uh, sell our mothers for a dollar, anything to make a dollar. And sometimes that leads to this next issue, which is being unethical. There are gray lines and there are black and white lines. And a lot of times performance marketers will just push that envelope. For example, um, we had a financial services firm that we worked with and there was a landing page with a form 
on it. And one of the things, because it was financial and personal information, you had to have a disclaimer right ab above the button. This was, I believe, the FCC rules. And it clearly said, you know, this disclaimer text has to appear above the button. Is they didn't want you to bury it down the footer and four point type that was the same or slightly different shade as the background color of the website. Okay, that, that's the kind of tricks they were trying to avoid. So you know what our clients asked us to do? They said, well, yeah, we can put the compliance text above the button. In fact, let's shove it into the header. And technically, that was in compliance because it was quote unquote above the button. It was so high on the page, it had no connection to the button and no one was looking for it in the header. So it was effectively ignored and it had the same effect as putting it down below the button. But that's the kind of little tricks and ethical gray areas that, that direct response marketers uh, often play in. And finally, there's the issue of consistency. Now it's one thing to be of a, a brand guardian, I'll put it kindly instead of calling them brand Nazis, that insist on perfection in terms of compliance with the look and feel. but you know, the, one of the things that comes out of the direct response folks and the digital marketing side is all the campaigns look different. None of them look like each other and certainly none of them match the brand guidelines. So that's often a huge problem. So what's the favorite phrase of the direct response side? We should test that. How many of you have actually said that in the last month? Again, Go into the, the question pane and admit it. Have you said, we should test that in the last 30 days? I just want a simple yes or no. Look, this is therapy for, for marketers, but we can all be honest with each other, I hope, here in the, in the webinar. And by the way, I've said that a time or two. As some of you may know, I've written a couple of best-selling books on landing page optimization, and testing is certainly a, a core activity of optimizing digital marketing. It's not the only one, and if that's all you're using, you're definitely fighting with one hand tied behind your back, but it is a very, very common thing. Let's just try it. So what does that lead to? Well, the typical end result of direct response campaigns is something you've probably seen if you're old enough like me to have watched TV, is screens like this. Hey, as seen on TV, a special offer only four payments of $19.95 plus shipping and handling, which is always like $9.99, have you noticed that? So this is it. This is the end result of all of that testing, all of that fiddling, all of that optimizing. And we can be proud on the direct response side of, hey, works better than everything else we've tested. So again, you're probably seeing that this is not exactly a flattering view either. The branding guys don't like us. We don't like the branding people. And in between is a lot of friction and pain and lost opportunity and unhappiness with the results. So we do understand direct marketing. I don't have to explain that to you, but let's talk a little bit about what branding really is. And I'm just going to give you some, some useful ways to think about branding. So the traditional view of branding is actually that you're projecting something out to the world. It's megaphone time. I, I use my, um, you know, European soccer announcer voice, goal! You know, that's kind of um, what branding is supposed to be. You just, just yell louder than everybody else and then eventually people hear you. Unfortunately, we're all living in, in very, very much an information, not rich, in an information overloaded world and we have the attention span of a lit match. So if this ever worked, it's not gonna happen today. Another thing to understand about branding is that they're really hard to change. Uh, I once uh, had a friend who was stationed on a nuclear aircraft carrier here in San Diego where I live, and he was telling me about, I think it's called a J-turn. So this is when the ship is going full speed, about 30 knots. They throw it with a rudder, you know, hard to the right or to the left. The whole ship tilts at a 20 degree angle, and then they, can, they make a U-turn effectively at sea. Do you know how long it takes them to make a U-turn at sea? A mile and a half to turn 180 degrees at full speed. A mile and a half. Think about that. When you have a brand and it has momentum and it's powerful, it's going in a certain direction. So to try to modify that is going to be really, really hard. I'll give you an example. I, uh, some of you may be on the East Coast. I, I, 
he went to high school in New Jersey and you know, we had Comcast. They've re recast themselves as Xfinity now, but Comcast is not exactly a well appreciated brand. So if you Google Comcast sucks right now, and this was a while ago, you'll get hundreds of thousands of results. And the only way that they're gonna try to get away from this is to rename themselves Xfinity and try to leave all that baggage behind it. But Comcast still sucks and it'll probably take a whole generation of their customers to die before that perception even has any small chance of changing. Another example from back in the older days is the Oldsmobile. There was this ad that they ran in magazines. This is not your father's Oldsmobile. Well, that's true. It's probably more like my grandfather's. They were trying to kind of update their image and pretend that they're new and hip and cool, and they redesigned their logo instead of that that little um, you know, rectangle with uh, the lines in it. They decided to do this logo. Yeah, except it didn't really help. So their brand died along with their buying public because younger people were not buying their cars. I mean, the name Oldsmobile should tell you enough in and of itself. So 2004, bye-bye Oldsmobile, shut down. All right, another way to think about branding, and this is also helpful, uh, if any of you have read Reese and Trout's book, it's kind of a classic on positioning, is to think about a brand as a ladder and a shortcut. So if I ask you, name a toothpaste brand right now, let's do this in the Q&A. Go ahead and enter, just type it in real quick. Toothpaste brand, type it in. I'll be. I'll wait, it's okay. Colgate, okay, we got some people coming in. Colgate, all right. Yeah, Tom's, Crest, okay. Hey, I'm gonna show you a magic trick, you ready? Crest, Colgate, how many of you typed those in? Wow, I'm just an amazing mentalist and magician and I figured that out. Well, no, those are the best known brands, but you know what, actually, when I originally worked on this presentation, I went to my local supermarket, the Vons, and looked at all the different brands they had on the shelves. It was over 180 different brands of toothpaste. And yet the only ones, yeah, some of you are like, okay, yeah, Aquafresh made it, but our Tom's, you know, but the only ones that most people think of are Crest and Colgate because they're by far the market leaders. So you have the 800 pound proverbial gorilla, you might have a couple of chimps scrambling for second place, and then there are a bunch of really skinny and underfed monkeys that are clawing over the scraps because that's the way positioning works. A strong brand is just cuts through it. It's like this mouse in the maze with the cheese. It just chews its way right through. A strong brand is identified unconsciously. You don't have to expend conscious effort thinking about it. Okay? But if I gave you a different set of problems, for example, um, what's the, uh, the most popular coffin manufacturer in the United States? Well, chances are you don't know because you don't have any familiarity with it. Unlike toothpaste, you don't use coffins every morning, hopefully, unless you have some a really big backyard and a soundproof dungeon that I don't know about. In any case, back to our regularly scheduled programming, we don't know things that we're not familiar with, but once that brand drills itself into our heads, it's a shortcut to decision-making. So the dominant brand in a category, I've made these wonderful little snapshotable um, slides here if you want to grab them for the key points. The dominant brand in a category achieves mental shortcut status. You literally don't have to consciously think about the decision anymore. It's on autopilot. And it's, it's a very powerful place to be. A brand is also a frame. And we're going to do a quick test here. Uh, so get ready uh, and answer this in the question uh, pain. I'm going to ask you on this next screen, after this one, which inner square is darker? I'm gonna show you a square inside of a square, and two sets of them. So you just have to put in left or right, which inner square is darker? You ready? Take a look at this. Which inner square is darker? The vast majority of you are thinking the one on the left. But what if I removed the outer squares and showed you the actual inner square side by side? Hmm, a little different. They're actually identical. You probably won't believe me, so let me go back to the previous slide so you can take a look again. They're actually identical. What changed your mind, what influenced you, was the frame around the square, which was the, the, the larger square behind it. 
the context really matters. The fact that they're identical is only when there's no context. So the power of branding is the unconscious backgrounds that frame the foreground, if you will, experience that we're having. So I'm gonna show you this to you in a very tangible way. And again, I'm gonna show my Gen X roots here by going back to TV commercials. Um, and there was a very famous, like Folgers Instant Crystals. Don't ask me what an instant crystal is. It sounds kind of gross, but they ran this line of Folgers TV commercials, and they were all set in five-star restaurants, like Tavern on the Green in New York and you know similar Michelin three-star kind of places. And at the end of the meal, they would say, we secretly replace the fine coffee you normally serve with Folgers Instant Crystals. And people went nuts for it. <laughs> when they had them on hidden camera, they said things like, oh, it's very, very rich and delicious. The best coffee I've ever tasted. And this kind of stuff went on and on. But the reality was Folgers was not the brand frame for the experience. It was the famous restaurant. What made you appreciate the coffee was the frame around it. It was the fact that you got dressed up. You went out in your nice car. Some nice young man probably valeted it for you. You were ushered to your table. Oh, welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Ash. Have a seat. And people swept crumbs off of your table with silver scooper spoons. And at the end of this wonderful meal, you had the coffee and dessert. And in that context, the coffee was delicious and perfect. And it had nothing to do with the coffee or the quality of it, which no offense, but dehydrated uh, coffee crystals, still probably not my first choice under any circumstances. So brands provide the context in which which increases the perceived value of the product. The product doesn't even actually have to be that good. It can actually be pretty stinky, but the context in which we experience it is all important and brand helps with that. So we can also switch to kind of the physical presentation of brands. If you look at the American Marketing Association, they have this definition, a lot of which has to do with the appearance of the brand and the physical manifestation of it. So we're gonna do another quick set of tests. And I just want you to think in your mind of the answer. You won't have time to type it in. But if I ask you right now to name a cigarette brand, think about what you just thought, all right, here we go. What if I said a cigarette brand and tall black letters? Chances are I'm building something, you'll recognize it. What if I just showed you these four tall black letters? I bet you can recognize it. That's because this is probably the brand you've been thinking of all along. It's a really, really powerful brand. What if I just said the color red associated with a cigarette brand? Just those words, remember, I'm not showing you anything visual. I'm saying solid red color. You're probably still thinking Marlboro. If I showed you this and I said, what cigarette brand does that evoke? You're thinking Marlboro. Certainly if I show you their chevron that's at the top of their package their their trade dress if you will you'll recognize it but there are other ways to evoke it that all had to do with the actual kind of logo type if you will the colors the letters but what if i just said lone cowboy on the range so what cigarette brand do you associate that with you'd still say marlboro in fact here's their a magazine ad for a long time and they they actually have their logo in it. They have the little pack of cigarettes and that's fine. But most of it is taken over by this, you know, this uh, cowboy who's got some kind of branding iron in his hand. Pardon the pun, branding. I didn't even catch that the first time I used that picture. But what about if we just, if you, this is their most subtle ad. What do you think of this? That's enough to evoke Marlboro. Folks, they're not even using their box or their logo type on it. So that lone cowboy on the range represents the brand. How did that get into your head when I asked about cigarette brands? By the way, I have to admit something now. I kind of tricked you. This was not a Marlboro ad. This is just a stock photo that I pulled somewhere off the internet, probably illegally. But it's the underlying mental model, and that's my point. The underlying mental model is what evokes the brand. So rugged masculinity and independence is the name of the game for Marlboro. And when they did the original campaign, 
the Marlboro man, the cowboy, was just one of the first ones. They were going to run follow-ups. The construction worker, the sea captain, the war correspondent, and finally, the weightlifter. These were all going to be follow-ups, but they did so well with the Marlboro man that they just stuck with it, probably for focus and repetition to their definite advantage instead of featuring all these different types of rugged masculinity, if you will. So the problem though with trade dress is it can also be easily manipulated. Would you smoke this brand of cigarettes? Let me ask you that. Okay, I'm in California. I have to admit, this kind of makes sense in our context here, but easy to trick the mind. How about this? Your favorite cola? Hopefully not if you speak Spanish. Coma caca, uh, not a very good thing to drink. Okay, so we've talked about brands a lot, but let's do this kind of uh, confessional here. Chances are you probably don't have a brand. You're not iconic. You're not at the top of your category. And you may think, you know, we're the world's leadies, leading solution for fill in the blank. And I would probably call bullshit on that. Unless you have a world-class brand like Marlboro, like Coca-Cola, um, like um, Disney, you don't have a brand. You you just think because you've read enough Gartner research reports that in your narrow category, you might be somewhat of a leader, but that's not reality. Here, let me ask you a quick question. Do you recognize any of the following things on this list? If you do, tell me what they are. Tell me what are the things on this list. Type it into the questions if you actually recognize any of these and describe what these are. These are product names, but what are they product names of? Polaroid camera, Polaroid cube flash, nope. Nope, you know what this was? This was a list of GoPro alternatives. Quick show of hands, you don't have to type this in. How many of you have heard of GoPro? Guess what, just about every hand just went up. But you never heard of those other alternatives. They're just as good. A lot of them are like half the price or a third of the price. They're even compatible and snap into the same mounts and work work the same way and give you better resolution and more, more battery life and the larger memory cards, all that stuff. But you never heard of them because GoPro stole their thunder. So unless you're Go, the GoPro of your category, you don't have a brand. So bad news. Now that's the bad news. The good news is you have the freedom to see what resonates with your audience. And this is where we as direct response marketers have kind of as a bit of an advantage. So let me now shift gears and instead of talking about one side or the other, describe a new way forward. And again, both branding and direct response are bright in a sense but they're also blind to each other's blind spots in a sense. It's like the fable of the blind men touching the elephant and each describing it differently depending on which part of it that they're, they're touching. So what is a brand that where it really matters? The brand is what lives in the minds of the customers. Again, back to our, our old friend, John Wanamaker, when the customer enters my store, forget me, she is king. That's what he said, and the focus is absolutely right. The focus should be on your customers and specifically on the inside of their heads. I love this quote. Your brand is whatever your customers say it is, period. Full stop, mic drop. I don't know what whatever trite thing you want me to say next, but this is the most important thing that I'm gonna tell you today. Please don't leave the webinar. I got more good stuff, but this is the most important. The brand is whatever your customers say it is. So the brand is the underlying mental association that's evoked inside of people's heads. And so one of the key things that we have to do as direct response marketers and branders is to align the presentation with the brand frame. Now, Phil Barton, who is um, an amazing guy in the, uh, who, kind enough to blurb my latest book. Uh, he wrote this amazing book, one of my favorite marketing books, period, uh, called Decoded. And in it, he talks about implicit goals that your brand satisfies. If you look at this wheel, these are like basic kind of unconscious motivators. We would need a sense of adventure, autonomy, discipline, security, enjoyment, and excitement. And if you look at them, if something along that axis is in the middle, that means it's little. This is one of those spider charts. So the further you are from the center, the more of that quantity or of that, that 
uh, quality rather there is. So let's design an ad together. I did a lot of the work for you. Here it is. Ready? It's for a sports car. Welcome to your new weekend view, the exhilarating new sports coupe from, and we're going to fill in the blank. Okay. So that's the ad. And we're going to try it in a couple of different brand frames. But let's look first at the ad's implicit goals. If you look at it, it's very high on the enjoyment, obviously, that weekend view, excitement, adventure, yes. Autonomy, yes. I'm independent. I can drive where I want. Discipline, yeah, not so much. See how it's closer to the center here? And certainly not security. That you're, you're not going for that weekend drive because of security. So that's the ads promise. And now we have to see how well it aligns with the brand frame. Let's try the BMW brand frame first. And probably most of you are familiar with, with uh, BMW and the certain qualities come to mind, right? Uh, high performance, precise, exciting. It's the ultimate driving machine, I believe, is, was one of their taglines. So you actually, you're supposed to enjoy the driving. So it seems like it fits pretty well uh, you know, the brand promise of BMW, if you look at it, it's a little more balanced than the ad because they do sell, you know, sedans and not just sports cars. And But, you know, they tend to be a little more on the adventure, excitement, enjoyment side. So if we overlap this and put the ad in the BMW brand frame, we get this. Welcome to your exciting new weekend view, the exhilarating new sports coupe from BMW. And then their little logo in the lower right here. It works, folks. It works. And this is the reason it works. The reason it works is if you overlap the ads, implicit motivations and promise, it works well with the BMW brand frame. There's a lot of overlap. You can see that. All right, let's try another one, brand frame though. This time we'll try Volvo. All right, here we go. How many of you think of Volvo like this? those boxes from the 1980s. Yeah, safe, functional, boring, that's a Volvo. A little quirky perhaps in that you know, Swedish way. No offense, I don't want hate mail from Swedish people, love ya. Yeah, but what are the Volvo brand implicit goals? Well, they're very high on autonomy. You have to be a kind of a quirky individual and go your own way. Discipline for sure, security, huge. They've been selling safety for seven or eight decades now. But enjoyment, yeah, exactly a hallmark of Volvo. Certainly not excitement or adventure. You can see how close to the to the zero point those two are right there. So that's the brand promise of Volvo, whether you know it or not. So when we do this ad, does this work? And the answer is no, it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is again because of the congruence between the brand frame and the promise of the ad, it's very low. Look how little overlap there is. The main overlap is actually on autonomy. Yes, there's autonomy involved in having a fun weekend drive, and there's autonomy and certainly kind of a peculiar, I'm doing it my way involved in buying a Volvo, I would say. So there's some overlap there, but generally there's very little overlap. So what's the reality? Well, let's take a look, you ready? Here is, or at the time I did this, was the latest uh, BMW sports coupe. Pretty hot, right? It fits. And, and this one too, check out this, this BMW. Very nice, right? Wah, wah, wah. Okay, sorry, I tricked you again. Actually, that's the Volvo. That's the competing car. And Volvo used BMW as the benchmark and they built a great engine, great handling, great styling, everything. It is competitive in every way, price with that BMW. And the end result is, unfortunately for the Volvo people, it's not gonna sell very many. That's the problem. It still doesn't build the brand frame. You can't, it's like that aircraft carrier turning around. You can't turn 70, 80 years of safe, Volvos are safe, into Volvos are exciting sports coupes. No. That's just too big of a leap. Okay, so let me lay out a framework now for putting this all together and for succeeding in this. We're on the same side. The branding and the direct response people are on the same side. So here's your checklist for success. The first thing is reality check your brand. Now, what does that mean? 
That means stop listening inside of your own echo chamber. Go out there into the real world. Go in your social media feed and see what people are typing about your brand. And it usually sucks or couldn't get an answer from customer service or <clears throat> it broke and it wasn't covered under warranty or these people screwed me or that's the reality of your brand. So again, unless you have a stellar brand that are the very curated reputation, it's better to be reality-based. Another thing you might want to do is talk to your frontline customer service people. They'll give you an earful of what people really think of your brand outside of the marketing department. Trust me, customer service, returns, anybody involved in customer facing stuff. Pass the sales process because you know, salespeople are always gonna sell them the sunshine and they actually believe it. They have to drink the proverbial Kool-Aid. All right, so once you've reality checked your brand, see what it actually stands for. What Understand your offer, and then what is the unconscious motivations that your offer is promising? What are the implicit goals, the very primordial, primal goals, excitement, enjoyment, security, all of those that your offer is actually speaking to? That's really, really important. And then make sure that the frame is congruent, that the offer is congruent with the brand frame. Because remember, the offer is not being examined in a vacuum if they know anything about your brand, and they do, and it's really much worse than you think, that you should at least do it reality-based. The offer is very much influenced by the frame that you put it in. And this is where we can have fun. I'm not saying that direct response marketers can't fiddle with different wordings, different ways to get at those motivations, different graphics and visual focus and calls to action and all of those tricks. I call them the triggers. What's going to get you to pull the trigger? Let's play with different triggers. We have the concept. We have what the promise of the ad is. We think it's aligned with our brand frame. Now we need to just activate that somehow. And this is really, really important and doesn't happen nearly enough in most companies. When you see how people are reacting in the field, as they say, on the ground in military terms, to your campaigns, to what you're trying, that should be used as feedback and fed back into your, your branding folks. It's a reality check and it'll bring the brand you know, guidelines and everything else into closer alignment with what people like and react to or don't like and aren't reacting to, equally important. Now, I have a number of books for you to read, uh, some, some reading assignments. A great book by uh, Susan Weinshank, who's uh, uh, the second edition of this is out now, 100 Things Every Designer Needs to Know About People, if you wanna understand how to consciously move people to action, unconsciously rather, that's a great book. Brain Influence by my friend Roger Dooley, a great summary again of the behavioral economics literature out there. Um, this is kind of the seminal book on psychology and motivation and sa sales by Robert Cialdini. Uh, he's, he's, he's also got a new edition of this out, and I highly recommend his other book, which, which is also rolling out, called Persuasion. Not Persuasion, Pre-Suasion. Fantastic books. This is kind of must-reading, one of the Bibles in the field. Um, Biology by Martin Lindstrom. He talks again about modern kind of neuroimaging techniques and what we can tell about people, consumers' reactions when they're put in marketing situations and what that tells us about how people really decide. And Decoded, I've mentioned Phil Barton's book. This is gold. And he talks a lot about consumer products, but there's just that book is really, really packed with such solid information. I just have mine bookmarked and underlined and highlighted all over the place. Highly recommend it. And then this is small, oldie but a goodie. The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. If you want to understand the fundamentals of positioning, you have to read this book by Reese and Trout. My own book, this is the second edition of my landing page optimization book. I have quite a bit in there about consumer behavior and about uh, persuasion and marketing. And a lot of it's evergreen, despite some of the older screenshots. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about myself. I appreciate you listening in. Then we'll throw it over for a Q&A. So if you haven't done your questions yet, whatever this is brought up for you, please, please, please start typing in your questions and Thomas is gonna pitch them to me uh, in the Q&A starting very shortly. So start thinking about things you wanna talk about or questions for me. Uh, just some quick background. Um, I'll just let you read these slides. You're, you're welcome to grab them uh, as well as one of the handouts. The PDFs are available. I've worked 
ran a digital marketing optimization agency called Site Tuners for 20 years. We had 1.2 billion in documented value created. Uh, since then, I'm focusing mostly on keynoting and um, marketing training for companies and executive advisory for people that want to take their online marketing to the next level. So if, if any of that makes sense, feel free to reach out. Uh, I mentioned my latest book. Um, this is it, Unleash Your Primal Brain. If you want to pick up a copy of it, uh, just go to primalbrain.com uh, and it's it's available there. Actually, yeah, I mentioned Robert Cialdini earlier. He was kind enough to, to provide a, a blurb. He really liked the book. So, hey, if Robert likes it, Hopefully you will too. No, this is seriously, this is a great overview of evolutionary psychology. What does that mean in practical terms? If you want to understand how you think, you have to figure out how our brains evolved and got here. So I go from early life all the way to the things that make us uniquely human. There's just tons of nuggets and insights in there. If you're a marketer, I'm going to do probably a follow-up book specifically on how to apply it to neuromarketing, but you'll get all kinds of insights just by reading it. So if you do pick up a copy, give me a shout out and let me know what you think. I'm very sociable uh, and uh, please feel free to get in touch. Here's here's how to stay connected. And uh, again, this will be in the slide handout that you can download and you know, feel free to put a meeting on my calendar if you wanna talk. Uh, I wanna offer something to the PDMI audience. I've talked about this with Thomas. We're gonna do five free online strategy reviews. So you get to talk to me, uh, directly about your online marketing strategy. We'll record the whole thing via Zoom. As long as you qualify and you do at least a million dollars in online value, whether it's direct revenue or lead value, um, that's that's my only ask. Limited availability, usually these go really fast in, in these webinars and online seminars. So this is what you do. The call to action is email me, tim at timash.com. And the subject line is help me with strategy, exclamation point. First five qualified people get that review and I'll reach out to you to schedule. All right, well, that brings me to the end of my uh, my prepared presentation. I'm really looking forward to answering your questions. So please, please, please type them into the question pane and uh, Thomas will uh, relay them to me. Now back to you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Um, we do have a few questions here to, to get things rolling. As Tim noted, please, if you do have a question, send it through the questions portal and uh, and we'll get to it hopefully. Uh, first one um, comes through. Uh, if you had to choose to use DR or branding and you could only pick one, what would you choose and why? Ah, well, again, um, my, I think the whole point of my presentation was that they have to work together and you can't do one without the other. Um, I don't know how many of you in the audience, I haven't personally, but been to see the Taj Mahal, for example. But you know, you always see this beautiful building, this ethereal purple light around it, usually at sunset, and, and it just looks amazing. Well, what I've been told by people that have actually been there is the reality of it is not the same. It's really smoggy, that's what makes the air purple. And around it, because it's no longer out there in the periphery somewhere, a city has grown, and in fact, it's surrounded by slums, endless slums. Now, is that a vision of the Taj Mahal that you wanted? No, but that's the brand frame. Nothing exists by itself as a direct response offer. If they know anything about your company, they that's your brand frame. So you can strengthen your brand frame or make it suitable for a particular purpose. You can strengthen your offer, but ideally it's one plus one equals 100. You really need to have them synergistically play together. You cannot do one or the other. Great. Um, another another question just rolled through. Um, uh, formats for branded response versus direct response. What are the main differences from a creative execution or format for brand hmm, versus that's a, that's direct a response question. or response? Um, the, the purpose of a brand, unless they have direct interaction with you, if someone comes to an Apple store, that's an interaction. If someone plays with their iPhone, that's an interaction. But in the absence of that, if you're just trying to get it from an advertising perspective, Branding has to speak in really, really simple blocks. Uh, I just finished up reading this uh, interesting book by Jamie Mustard. It's called The Iconist, and he talks all about the art and science of standing out. Uh, and one of the things he talks about is visually or verbally 
repeating these massive keys, monolithic ideas that are really, really strong. And so for branding, for advertising purposes, your number one goal is to cut through the clutter. There's so much impinging on us. By some estimates, over 10,000 marketing and advertising impressions per day from the moment you wake up to the, the, the time you turn out the light and go to sleep with your cell phone right next to you you're getting impinged on. So the goal of branding is to at least create awareness and through advertising it has to be simple and bold. Whereas uh, direct response can be a little more nuanced, can lead you down the garden path in multiple steps and so on. Um, but branding has to be bold in order to cut through the clutter. So don't be timid, have a point of view on the branding side. If you stand for nothing, no one's gonna notice you. Great. Um... Next question, uh, and that may be, it may be reversed, I'm not sure, but uh, how did you come through the world of evolutionary psychology into the world of uh, digital marketing? Wow, great question. Uh, actually, I started there when I ended up at University of California, San Diego on a full UC region scholarship, and I studied, my undergrad majors were dual major in computer engineering and cognitive science, which was in psychology at the time and then became its own department. My graduate work was in machine learning, it was back in the day called neural networks. Um, and all of that had to do with cognition, of training from repeated examples of how brain works. So we had um, neuroscientists and economists and Don Norman who's the, the most famous UX person who came up with the concept of user-centered design. So I grew up in this kind of interdisciplinary stew which focused on how people actually do what they do and why they do it so i'm kind of going full circle i started there i applied it to marketing and made our clients a bunch of money and now i just want to talk about it because i see it as like the durable advantage if you're a marketer to focus on that stuff it doesn't become obsolete regardless of what the technology will be tomorrow i mean i don't care if it's vr or holographic suppositories, it doesn't really matter. You're still trying to influence the human brain. So as a marketer, you have to place all your bets on understanding that. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, another question, uh, do you have any spe specific examples of websites with high converting landing pages? Uh, you know, I get this question a lot and I'm always hesitant to say anything. I mean, it's a lot, I I'm kind of like, to paraphrase Will Rogers, I've never met a landing page that I like. So I always, just super critical, I'm on the side of the audience of the unfortunate visitors that have to suffer through that landing page experience. So I'm always picking out what's wrong. I haven't found the perfect landing page. I don't think such a thing exists. The other thing that I'd say is like our advanced clients, when I used to run my agency site tuners, um, most of them were doing personalization. Most of them had uh, marketing automation behind the scenes and sending very personalized email messages as well. Their site would change based on whether you'd been there before, if you're a return visitor, uh, or depending on whether you downloaded something or not. So there's no such thing as the best on average experience. That's kind of a misnomer. The best experience for me is not the same best as the best experience for you. So the best experience is one that's tuned to the particular person and their past behavior and interactions with you. But that's kind of an advanced thing, you know, so it's a crawl, walk, run situation. Um, you have to get the basics right, but eventually you have to do mass customization and personalization to get the best experiences. Makes sense. Um, what challenges, uh, what are the biggest challenges brand marketers face when they begin to use direct response marketing techniques? Oh, you mean how to make this, I'm, I'm taking that to mean how to make the switch from being brand side to being more ROI driven or direct response. Um, I think you know, one of the things is that it's the difference between subjectivity and objectivity. On the branding side, it was okay to have an opinion and very strong opinions, whether it's the CEO or your creative director, um, were the ones that mattered. And recognition of your peers and how cool or wacky and unusual is something that can be good as a pattern interrupt, the cool and wacky to get attention, but not just for its own sake or the adoration of your peers. On the direct response side, what matters is money. And um, in a way, we direct response marketers have it easier because we can 
point to the bottom line and say, I made this company money. And if I do this, or if we invest this much more to drive this traffic or fix our website, then I can make you even more money. That's a huge advantage over marketing is that accountability, or sorry, over branding is that accountability. My one suggestion, if you're doing this within a company is you stop talking all the technical jargon. I don't care about bounce rates, click through rates, you know, form fill rates, you know, dropouts and your um, you know, abandonment recovery sequence, any of that stuff. If you want to get respect and a seat at the at the grown up table, you have to start language of money because that's the only thing that upper management understands. Say we did this, this made money. Let's do more of it. That should be your motivation, and it makes it a lot easier to get big chunks of money to do what you need to do. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, another question popping through. Do you have an opinion regarding discounting? Many DR companies sell based on discounts. What does that do to your brand, positive or negative? Yeah, I have a whole workshop on, on neuromarketing where I talk about pricing and, and framing it. I think um, there was a, a really famous science fiction author, Isaac Asimov, who wrote this series of books called The Foundation. And then he had this phrase, which I'll never forget, which is, Violence is the last resort of the incompetent. And if I were to translate that into marketing terms, I'd say discounting is the last resort of the incompetent. I'm really strongly against it. I've seen it destroy many brands. And, and it, um, it always kind of, you're, you're just conditioning people. We're just monkeys. We just like do the same thing over, press the lever, you get the banana. You know, if you condition me to expect four or five emails a week, I shit you not, we've had clients do this, with sending discount coupon codes to, to, their, to the clients that have already bought from them, never mind prospects, right? They're conditioning their clients to underpay, to look for discounts, to never pay full price. I think that's, that's a, a race to the bottom, and I think it's awful. There's a lot of things you can deploy to keep your pricing high, and you should be working on making sure your value proposition is clear and relevant to your audience instead of discounting. Great. Now the, uh, the, the question spigot definitely opened up here. Um, <laughs> uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on 10-second creative? I've seen many DR and D2C companies using them lately with great success because they're using the lower cost, high reach to increase branding and hence sales both online and retail rather than all one traditional way or another. So thoughts on 10 second creative. You know, I'm really not that familiar. Uh, so I have no opinion at all. I'm unfortunately, I'm out of the loop. My kids told me that yeah, dad, you know, you're, you're stuck in the eighties and you know, okay, well maybe, the, <laughs> maybe the 2010s, but apparently it's a new decade. It's uh, it's like we were talking about beforehand, uh, uh, newspaper versus online versus TikTok. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, well, I mean, honest answer. Uh, thanks. Uh, next question. Many of our DR web pages that perform best have cluttered hero banners with all features, promo offers listed to make the sale. There's no place for branding in this format. Anything done differently with more branding always fails and relative to sell, the sell pages. How can you reconcile this? Okay, that's a great question. Well, I think that goes to just in general, the, the issue of too much clutter. A lot of times, um, what we do in testing and direct response is we say, what if we added this, okay? What if we added another feature? What if we added uh, something that uh, will um, be a proof point? What if we added a testimonial? What if we uh, added something that was you know, featured in um, another kind of um, you know, media magazine and put their logo up? And so what we do is we keep adding, 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 adding to the page. And unfortunately, what we get is just death by barnacles, you know, like those barnacles that collect on the hull of a ship. Well, there's just a few, it's not a problem, but eventually it'll slow the ship down because there's so many and they're growing on there. So one of the things that I recommend doing is actually start taking things away. See if removing significant chunks will actually bring clarity and better response. Now, what this has to do with branding is if you're going to have a brand or if or a powerful visual block or value proposition, make sure it's clear and has room to breathe. A lot of times white space and negative space in the physical page helps you focus, helps you group things. You don't want it to be you know, just a, a, like a phone book with tiny, tiny, oh yeah, who remembers those? Tiny, tiny little print that goes over the whole page because you wanna fill in every square pixel on there. 
Makes sense. Um, I think we've uh, run through most. Tim, Tim's out. <laughs> And I apologize. The, the the wonders of doing webinars at home is that the the gardeners next door <laughs> decided to cut cut the hedges. I, just I hear you. I had, a, I had the first time we did one of these. I had uh, the people next door decided that that was the day that their house power washed. So <laughs> I know how that goes. Um, uh, it looks like uh, looks like uh, that's it for the the big questions. I got a question. How many uh, show bat? This is for those of us who are hungry to have an event. A real live <laughs> event sometime hopefully in 2021 how many show uh, badges do you have on that wall behind you oh geez um yeah you feel free to turn off the screen sharing and go back to talking heads <laughs> mode. um let's see it looks like about 20 rows about 20 uh yeah about probably about three to four hundred you're not even seeing mm -hmm. the full wall here i'll give you a slightly better view it just kind of keeps going so wow. there you go <laughs> that's crazy yeah it's cheaper than wallpaper at this point yeah all right fantastic. <laughs> wow. well i think that is it um thank you everybody uh we appreciate the feedback uh and the and the questions wonderful uh interaction thank you tim uh for for your your wisdom uh thanks for sharing the deck with everybody and and also reminder everyone in the handouts don't forget grab uh chapter 13 of tim's new book a pdf is in there in the handouts area as well as his deck and the pdmi membership brochure so while i'm still talking please go download those now um we appreciate all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend this event video of it will be made available on our website in the coming days our next event is PDMI West Virtual, a three-day educational webinar event featuring eight one-hour sessions on September 14th through 16th. Please visit our, visit our website at thepdmi.com for more info and your opportunity to register and join us for this blockbuster virtual event. Thank you again, Tim. Thank you, everybody else. Enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your work week, uh, work week and stay safe and stay well. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>